<clears throat> you got the script right. So I think we got everybody that's going to be here. A bird right. niece is not going to be with us. So turn over to our board president. I'm called this call the meeting to order. Uh, Joanne, would you please do a roll call vote? Or would it be easier if I did? Okay. You're on mic. Oh, do you want us to get you one or no? <laughs> it needs mic. <laughs> Mr. Ibarra? Mr. Flores? Mrs. Haro? Mr. Fuentes? Present. Mrs. Flores? Ms. Torino Heida? Present. Thank you. At this time, we have the uh, Mrs. Haro will lead us in the renewal of the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mrs. Harrow. Even though she took the even though she took a roll call? Probably not. Yeah. <clears throat> We are moving into public comment. Do we have any public comments? We do not. There are no public comments. At this time, I. <laughs> I I'll introduce to you uh, the, our guest tonight, our presenter, um, Gary Rutherford, who's our consultant, who's also, I understand, the former superintendent of Upland. You probably worked with a friend of mine, uh, Sherry Black. Yes, yeah, Sherry and I talked together many, many years ago. Yeah, and she's wonderful. Well, we're glad to have you here, and I'll turn the meeting over to you. I actually wanted to make a couple of oh, uh, sorry. comments. <laughs> pretty good going. Thanks, John. Sorry, former president. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we'll turn it over to Gary in, in, in a minute here. And as you stated, oh, I, I want to hear. So, as uh, as you stated, Joanne, yeah, Gary uh, is our consultant this evening. Uh, he's going to work with the board on our governance uh, workshop this evening. And uh, he, uh, as you stated, he's su he was superintendent of Upland and recently Desert Sands. And uh, I just wanted to th thank the board uh, for. Coming together uh, this evening, I know that uh, I've worked with uh, several board presidents and we've talked about having this type of workshop in the past. And so now that it's coming together, uh, I think that it, that is uh, so much appreciative on my end. And so again, thank the board for their uh, commitment to uh, this process. Uh, we've been sharing the governance handbook uh, combining uh, items and trying to put together something uh, that uh, the board protocols and those kinds of things that uh, we can govern by. So uh, I will also say uh, coming in into this is my fourth year and on the job, believe it or not, and and I know Gary, we've Gary, uh, th those are the years uh, of COVID were dog years, the COVID years shows. So, Seven times three, right? And you know, one of the things that I think about this is the the longevity of the superintendent, not necessarily Frank Miranda, but the superintendent is the number one indicator or factor on student achievement. Is just the, what the research says, uh, and and so uh, I just look forward to continue working with all of you moving forward. I mean, four four years, three years go by super fast, uh, especially during COVID. Uh, so hopefully the next uh, several years continue to work with uh, this uh, uh, very uh, uh, amazing board. Uh, you know, you hear throughout the county uh, that we just have a board that, uh, first of all, with the experience uh, and the community spoke loud and clear, I'll say this, uh, in the recent uh, elections that they want to keep this board, keep this district moving. And last thing I'll say is 
you know, the board's passed a vision. We have a design plan. We have a plan. And now we have to execute at a high level. And so the vision on student achievement heard loud and clear. You want to see that it's not just about test scores, but it's it's more than that. But test scores is what the community sees. Uh, it's not just about equity and providing every student, no matter where they come from, the same opportunities, uh, whether low socioeconomic, uh, high, or whatever reading level, but providing those opportunities, special ed, regular ed, gate, all those kids deserve the same opportunities. And then last, wellness. We know that COVID really the mental stress, the mental wellness, we focus on the social emotional, the year we came back in person, we continue to, to create uh, outstanding wellness programs. We have uh, for, for sure uh, our programs, uh, the wellness centers, the, pro the mental health wellness programs uh, at our school sites. Uh, and then uh, our partnerships with CryRop, with the different folks to get ensure that our students are given those opportunities so that the high school, when they graduate from high school, they are not only ready to go get a, a job, go to college, but obviously career and college, uh, college and career uh, is uh, within our vision statement. So I wanted to say that because I wanted to put a little bit of context behind this and and turn it over to Gary. But again, I wanna thank uh, all of you uh, for being here this evening. As you know, I was close to not being here, but but unfortunately, fortunately, uh, feel a whole lot better, and I won't get into the specifics. But uh, I will uh, definitely be more happy to talk to you one on one about that. Uh, but just uh, just happy to be here this evening with all of you, honestly. And I'll turn it over to Gary, uh, and uh, he'll get, he'll get it going here. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, if anyone's speaking, I can't hear you. So the the mic is so that online people can hear, because we have folks online. If we, because if we don't, then if you could track that, I don't know. Is that the whole purpose, right, for the mic for the online? Yeah, they're online. Oh, okay, we online. Okay, got you. I just want to make sure. There's a governance team working together. And it can't move along. And right now, I, uh, well, I should give you a little my background. I became superintendent in 2001, specifically September 11, 2001. I was standing down getting thumb printed from a new job that was a print set. Yes, Sergeant, nobody was coming to help this morning. They were all watching the TV. So then I noticed. All the police converging around the team. That morning. So uh, that was, I'll never forget my first day. I welcome. <laughs> it took six months to put my fingerprints to clear it for me to get a security clearance because the whole system shut, shut down that day. Which meant for my first six months, I couldn't be around school children unless I was accompanied by somebody. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's super dense, and I was proud of it. The kids and got my fingerprints in. I was in Huntington Beach City. I was there for four years, got my friend to go to Upland, where I spent my next eight years. So, and from there, um, uh, my wife and I had what I thought was a time. Like he said, and I got a ring for the super dead. I had a great four years there before I retired in 2016. Since that time, just as Frank was coming up, I was heading out. And, uh, 
since that time, I do board works, uh, a workshop like this, but I work with governance teams. A lot of that work center is really good for right now. State boards in the state of California, some of them have had major changes. In the so my work has increased mightily since January with superintendent calling saying, I need something to get here quick. The board workshop, we got to get these new people up. Frank and I have talked, and I have, along the lines, I've worked with Bertha, I've worked with Japan. Yeah, I'm just meeting everybody else that had a chance to meet either here or over in Chiron. But we spoke, he said, you know, I've got a single board. I said, we have a, we have a governance handbook. He said, no, we don't. I said, now is the time to do it. You do a governance handbook when you have a healthy, stable board. You can put it in the middle of the when you need them. They could be with this group. It's go sideways all the time. You know, you need to come back to the round of treatment. But if new members come in, Get you a full training. It allows you to kind of codify what matters most in full. So tonight, that's our job. We're going to be talking about your governance habits. We're going to be codifying that in the work in a handbook that later you will bring back and improve once it's revised. So we working very, very closely with Joanne and Frank, looking at other districts' templates, board president, and put together a proposal for you tonight that is a conversation starter. Can we can we get the mic closer to you? I guess the interpreters can. Oh. Uh, so now I really want the website. So our goal tonight is going to be going through a lot of content. Some of it will end up being your homework because we won't be able to get it all done tonight. We'll trust you read it. Get you back to Frank and Joanne. Regarding the handbook. So tonight, we read reference. Yes. We're going to use the draft of the handbook, and I'm going to draw all the copies. We draw all the copies. We also are going to be using California Supreme Court as a template for uh, governance handbooks. And a lot of what you'll see tonight comes out of that template. It's just effective practice that's proven over time, it's research based. And then finally, this guy here, published in 2009, the governance core is the single guiding light school governance across the country, written here in California by the authors. You may remember those who've been around Rock. Davis Campbell was the executive director for CN back in the day. And he wrote with Michael Cohen, who is a Canadian researcher who has written dozens of books and is one of the preeminent voices for school education. Two of them got together with what matters most about governance. So a lot of the work we do will be used to this is our research base. My commercial for the book. These are what colleagues, past president of NFBA, the director of CFBA, say about the governance board. They say it's great. Incredible user. So to get started, you know, even though we've been working together for a long time, there's all kinds of stuff you know. So we're going to start off. I just love to hear your stories. And I'm going to ask you, what's your why? Why did you make the choice to run for the school board? So you let me know when you, when you made that choice, when you first ran for school board, and then what do you hope will be your lasting legacy contribution? And I'm going to Frank the same thing about the superintendents. Okay. If he's, by the way, he's part of the governance team. He'll be participating for the whole time. I'm probably not going to start with you all you guys. <laughs> so you take a minute to think about it. Why did you run for the board? And what do you hope you'll leave? When your time on the board is done, what will be your legacy? And I, let's start with uh, Israel. <laughs> there we go. Turning it on helps. Well, now you can turn it back a little bit. I think they probably hiked it up when they couldn't hear me. Testing one, two, testing one, two. Best technology. <laughs> well, you've got somebody with not great hearing, so I wouldn't know if it was on or not. Is there any brave soul waiting to go first? Do you mind, Dan? Thank you. Thank you. Testing. Okay. And a great question, by the way. I actually had a chance to see the presentation before I came, and I thought, man, that's a really good question that I should probably ask myself more, much more regularly. Sometimes you forget. So I was I was elected in 2012 in a in what was technically a special election. So the seat was vacated by 
by Robert Armenta, who's I think a friend to probably all of us. Um, and he received a great job opportunity uh, elsewhere in Orange County and loved serving on the board, but could no longer serve. So it was an unexpected last minute opportunity, uh, vacancy um, for the seat. And if I remember correctly, it was right before the filing period. So there was literally a series of days, maybe a week before I had to decide whether I was going to do this, jump in and go. And it didn't take long. And I, at that point in 2012, I had been following things closely because if you all remember, that's when things were starting to go south from a, from a budget and economic standpoint with you know deferrals and, and cuts. And we were in a tough place and I had attended school board meetings, uh, kind of a public policy nerd. So yes, I was going to public, to public meetings and school board meetings and I was on the bond committee and we were looking at a potentially negative certified budget with it. So having a background in public administration, budgets, organizational management and MPA, I thought that's what I can do. I can bring this to the board, something very technical and focused that could probably help the school district in a time when, when we needed that. And that was the original impetus and thought behind jumping in. And it was interesting because it wasn't for political reasons, didn't have kids yet in the district. Um, it was thought I could bring something unique and based on my professional background and experience. So, okay. Thank yeah. you. And what do you hope your legacy will be when your time is, when you wind up your time? Um, <laughs> I think that this district, that every student in this district, and I'm a graduate, I'm a product of this district, that every student, irrespective of where they're coming from, what their background is, the level of education their parents may have, um, that they have every opportunity to shine. When I really think about it, started with something really technical, but now it's really simple. That they thrive, they shine, that their talents shine through, and they feel like they can go anywhere and do anything, whether that's Ivy League college, or starting a business or in the armed services and advancing, that they feel like they can be anything that they wanna be. That's it. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good start. Who'd like to go next? Joanne. Excuse me. Why did I make the choice to run for the school board? Um, couple of different reasons. First of all, I um, I have not been Colton all that many years, I, about 20 years now. Um, but back when they were having all this difficulty in the district, I was the principal in another, my previous district. My entire life, I've been in education. Um, I was very fortunate. I grew up in a very poor family, but I, I came from back east and I had a marvelous education. I, school was never hard. I had great teachers. And I was able to do something with my education to give me a future that my mom didn't have the opportunity to have. And, and so I believe very strongly that education is the key to a future for everybody. And <clears throat> when they were having the difficulty, I had grandchildren in this district, and I was upset thinking, this isn't okay for kids to get involved in this way. The young kids hearing about what's all the fighting and politicking and stuff for kids. And I thought, they need to have people on the board who truly care about the educational piece and not the politics. Um, I ran once and didn't make it, um, but right, well, I interviewed once and I didn't make it. Um, but later on after I got sick and I had to retire because I just couldn't keep up with the daily, you know, observing classrooms and doing this or doing that. Um, but I wasn't done. I just knew I wasn't done yet. So I decided that I would, when an opening came, uh, when Laura left, <laughs> I interviewed, and fortunately, I was able to uh, be selected. And I'm best decision I made. It's kept me involved with kids. We, as a board, have a huge responsibility to make sure that every kid in this district has a chance. And we look at it at all aspects. Kids are getting in trouble. What do we do with them? Do we, you know, how to? Every single kid matters. And if this board takes a a really active role in what happens with the kids, then we've given that kid a, a chance for a good future. And so my legacy, I hope, will be that I've done everything I can to show kids that learning is fun and have to develop a love of learning that they can take on into their adulthood and make a difference in our world. Because these kids are our future, and we can't let any of them down. You know, there's no do-overs. They have to get it. 
every single well, day. Well, some of them have do-overs, but we don't like them to have <laughs> But if we they don't go to that. school, they're how it, it hurts them, and they've right. got to be here, and we have to do what we can to make that happen every day. Thanks, Joanne. And so how many years on the board now, total? Ten. Ten. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So you've been serving longer than, wow. There you go. Who, who's next? Frank, when are you going next? Go next. Would you? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, well, thank you. I think that uh, with the first question, why I made a, a run for the school board, I think it goes way back. I've been around public service ever since a child. Uh, my grandfather was good friends with Cesar Chavez. And it was not unusual for me to get home from school and go through my grandparents' house and see my grandfather and Cesar Chavez playing harmonicas up in his porch. Or was that? In San Bernardino. And uh, the, the point is that uh, he was there because my grandfather led the grape boycott in the San Bernardino County area. So I was around that type of public service, political arena, very, very young age. Um, my mother's, and that was my, uh, my dad's father, my mom's cousin was a city councilman for years in, in San Bernardino. And uh, being part of that family, you know, we were always involved in different activities, events, and to help improve, uh, I grew up in the west side of San Bernardino. And so, um, excuse me, There's, it's that time of the year, as you guys all know. Okay. And so it, uh, it led me to have that mindset about wanting to be around helping people. As, uh, as I was growing older, my parents emphasized education to the point that when my father could no longer help us with math, he went to Valley College and took algebra classes one and two so he could help us. So he, they gave us a really great impression about the, how important education was. So the opportunity back in 96 came up when a board member here became mayor of Colton. And, and I had several people approach me, never thought about running for school board at that time. And I had already been part of several county boards, advisory boards. Uh, I was president, I was uh, leading different mental health boards because that was my original uh, career background, mental health, before I got into education. And so I said, well, let me think about it. So there were, at the time, there was about 12 individuals, all with doctorates, uh, running for board except for me. And I go, wow, this is interesting. So we went through the process and uh, lo and behold, it came down to me and another gentleman and a lady, a board member by the name of Pat Nix uh, voted for me and I got the 4-3 vote and I was appointed to the board at that time. Later on, she told me that the only reason or what persuaded her to vote my way was that I had my wife next to me and she knew that I would be a family man and that I would be caring for children. And so that type of started my, my, my run as a school board member. What would your goal be for your legacy? What would you like to leave behind Frank when your time is done? On this? Well, I, I look at all our students and the opportunities that is afforded to them. They're great opportunities. And as some may and some may not be aware that many of those opportunities uh, they're not familiar with. 
they don't know they exist. They don't see it because they didn't have the parental support that some of us might have had along the way. And uh, I felt that it was important to bring those to light to them, making sure that they take advantage. So over these last 27 years being on the board, uh, I've noticed the increase of events, increase of participation, um, increase of uh, development at all the school sites, because I truly believe that you know, we need to enhance the look of our schools so that our students can be proud of where they go. And to try to create an atmosphere here at Colton that will be welcoming, caring, and provide our students with the utmost opportunities for a quality education to take them to wherever career avenues they want to go in. Um, I've been part of bringing ROTC in. Um, I helped bring in uh, the CryRop originally, and all that with uh, with the emphasis that we wanted to give our students as many opportunities as possible. Thank you very much, sir. Would like to go next. Thank you, Bertha. Okay. Um, my name is Bertha Flores, and um, uh, why did I make the choice? Um, I retired in 2016 uh, from a, a career in, in education in various roles. So I re uh, retired uh, from a director of uh, English learners from this district uh, in 2016. Um, what I remember is um, Jerry Almendares one time, I received an award right before I retired, and, she, and he said, let you know let's let her get this retirement thing out of her system but in a few years she'll be back as a board member so at that point i thought what is he talking about <laughs> so um here i am and in a simple sentence i retired myself but my passion did not retire really quick that i still had that passion for our students and for education uh, I was appointed um, and I finished the term and then um, I decided to run. I ran unopposed, so here I am um, for four years, for the next four years. Uh, my legacy, uh, would I would love it to be uh, the love of books, love of reading for our students. And, and if uh, the kids can read by third grade, that is my passion that would be you know my ultimate goal um i also uh, like dual immersion so i would love to see ex that expanded so that's in a nutshell thank you i guess i'm next yes well about 15 years ago we moved uh, to a little community called uh, bloomington and uh when we signed up our girls at uh, grimes elementary uh my oldest was uh, in first grade and my youngest was still actually going to start preschool. She was about three years old, which is now she is currently a junior at Bloomington High, the three-year-old. So so I remember uh, heading out to their first PTA and I'm sitting there in the multi-purpose room and I'm looking at the uh, parents that are there and I was looking at the principal at that time. I think it was uh, Principal Carlton back then and Mr. Muniz back then. And uh, we didn't know that Grimes offered uh, the dual immersion program, which I, I was very impressed to hear that there was a, a Spanish English uh, program there. So they asked us if we were interested and we said yes. But going back to the meeting, the PTA meeting, so I was sitting there and no one wanted to become the next chair for PTA. So I looked at my wife and I whispered in her ear, what do you think? She goes, it's up to you. So I volunteered volunteered and became the next PTA president there at uh, uh, Grimes Elementary. As I worked PTA and did uh, not just PTA, but school site council, and then became vice chair, became chair of the ELAC there also, and the chair of uh, school site council at the same time, while I was chair of the PTA. So you can just imagine getting involved. After that, I heard about a, a, another uh, meeting that went on, which was called the Bloomington Municipal Advisory Council. So I ended up going to that meeting. And two weeks later, I was appointed to the uh, board there also by the previous uh, fifth district uh, supervisor, Jose Gonzalez. That's where I met Dan Flores too. So, so 
just being in the in the community for I think less than three months, I was already involved in this community very much. Then I went back and became a volunteer with the San Marino County Sheriff's Department, and uh, out of the Fontana Sheriff Station. And sure enough, Bloomington was one of the patrol areas of that station. So I was getting involved in the community, because, uh, getting to know the students, getting to know the parents, and getting to see the opportunities that some of the parents didn't understand. We, especially we have a big, big community of 90% of Bloomington is uh, Hispanic speaking too, so uh, which didn't understand very much of the items that were going on in the schools. And a lot of parents would ask, Mr. Fuentes, what about this program? Is this a good program? Mr. Fuentes, is this good? So literally, literally people would show up at my house in the evening, knock on my door and say, I have some questions about this. So one day I, I told my wife, you know, one of these days I'm going to run for school board because I think we need to have, uh, you know, this will give me an opportunity to bring stuff to the table and let the board know the needs that are the district needs. And so years passed, a few years passed. Uh, we moved here in 2009. So in 2018, I received a phone call. Received a phone call and said, Mr. Fuentes, my name is so-and-so. And I was just wondering if you're interested in running for school board and I'm willing to help you with that. And as being a Christian man, I told my wife, I told, I told her the lady on the phone, I said, can I pray about this? I want to make sure this is the right thing. I go, give me a couple of weeks. So I, I called my wife and I said, this just happened. And my wife says, okay, let's pray about it. Two weeks later, on the nose, this person calls me back and says, are you ready? And I went ahead and said yes. So it was a difficult run for me as a board member. It was, it was, it was tough, but I kept my head up because I knew that if I, kept, if I kept running without getting into the political part of it, because I'm not a political guy, I'm here to help the community. I'm here to advocate for the community. I'm a family man. And then having two girls in the school district really, really pushed me to become, you know, to fight harder, to be a better person in this community. The numbers came in the first day, and I was losing. As the weeks went by, because there's 30 days before they close, uh, you know, all this stuff, because they got to go through all these votes. My number kept going up, kept going up, kept going up. And the last and final, I ended up winning the uh, seat here in uh, Colton Joint Unified School District. It's, it's, I'm on my, my fifth year now, so I, I was just reelected again this uh, November. But, you know, one of the key things is yesterday we had tomorrow's leaders, and after the event was over, one of the security guards calls me out and says, a student wants to talk to you. I go, well, let him come and come on, you know, to the field. This young lady comes over, a freshman at Colton High School, and says, Mr. Fuentes, thank you. Thank you. For your leadership, thank you for the words of encouragement. Thank you for what you do for our district. Because if it wasn't for those words of encouragement, I would have probably dropped out of school. That is the key for me when I hear those things from students, when I hear the success of our students that graduate and they'll call me or they'll send me a message and say, Mr. Fuentes, I'm on my third year. I'm almost done with my master's, with my BA. I'm going for a doctorate. I just became a police officer. I just became a nurse. I just became... That's the goal of this board. And I know my colleagues have said it. No matter what you do, what they do, if they go on to college, a university, a tech school, be, open a business, I know that, that hopefully that little, that little seed of the CJUSD board is there. Uh, that little seed of mine is there. Because it, like they say, it takes a village. And we're part of that village. You know, sometimes we, we might not come to accordance in certain things, but you know something? We have a board 
that we'll always come to a consensus. We'll ask the questions, but we will always come to a consensus, consensus of anything. We have a great board here. I wanna thank my colleagues for that. Also the legacy, it'll show. One day when I'm not here, when I'm no longer a board member, the legacy is gonna be there. Whatever I did, it will show. Whatever my colleagues did, it will show. That's the legacy that we leave. Like that young lady that came up to me yesterday, I just left a legacy right there. Because one day that freshman will also do the same thing I did to another student, and it'll just become a domino effect. Thank you. Okay, um, so I ran for school board in 2004. I was urged by a, a former board member who got to know me uh, through science fair. My daughter was involved in the science fair in the Colton School District for 10 years. And um, he would see me volunteering, judging, being doing everything at science fair. And I would judge at the regional fair and the state fair, and he would see me there. And he came up to me one time at the regional fair and said, you know, you need to run for school board. You're the type of person that we need, somebody who really cares about kids and goes out of their way. And so I ran and I lost. <laughs> and I didn't realize how much I really wanted to do it until I lost. And um, so then when I lost, my daughter was started going into high school and uh, she went to Bloomington High School. And she was, uh, I was still very involved with PTA and doing all the things and volunteering. And she was taking an economics class at Bloomington High School. And economics, uh, AP economics was only a six, a half semester class before they do their AP test. And they were already four weeks, four or five weeks into the class and they had no books. And so, uh, back when we had the boardroom, the boardroom used to be uh, in our communications office, it was this little tiny thing. And I would be at every board meeting, every board meeting for, to, to find out what was going on in the district and what was happening. And I would show up and do the board member comment. I would be that mom. <laughs> and um, I came to the board meeting and said, you know, this is a six month class and it's already over a month and they don't have books. And the superintendent at that time got back to me and said, you know what, thank you for bringing it to our attention. It was sitting um, in the purchasing desk and it got buried under something else and never got ordered. And they got the order and they air freighted them and then they got here within a week. So, um, so those are the kind of things I was doing before I was a school board member. And so then after uh, when 2008 came, I decided my my daughter had graduated and I decided to run again and I won. And um, it's been the best decision I've ever made. Um, it's been a difficult decision and, and difficult, no, not always easy, um, but I love what I do. Um, my legacy, I want people, uh, you know, I agree with every, whatever the Bertha with the reading and, and, and everything else that everybody said that we all want you know, the same things because we all want the best for our kids. But on a personal note, I want people to remember me um, as a board member who was never afraid to speak her mind, who was always um, fighting for what's right, fighting for our kids, fighting for our community, fighting for our parents, um, because I was a parent and I was fighting and I want them to see that um, you know, political figures, because unfortunately we are political. I mean, even though I don't think of a school board as a political position, we are. And, you know, they have a bad rap. But this board does not have a bad rap in the community. And I would, you know, I'm, we're blessed because people believe in us. And that would be my legacy. Sure. Yes, sir. I'll be quick here. Uh, 
I mean, this journey started over 30, 30 years ago. I won't go through every detail because I've served at every level, instructional aid and everything, and teacher and administrator. 2008, uh, I wasn't hired in San Bernardino City Unified as a principal, and I took the chance of applying here and in Fontana and uh, just remember selecting Colton. I already had met, you mentioned Jerry. Uh, we had just started to become friends at that time, just acquaintances through uh, an organization. They didn't really know him too well, but I, I liked him a lot. And I said, I can work for this this uh, young man, very young man. Uh, just uh, he was uh, a role model to me and somebody I looked up to tremendously and still do to this day because I would not be here without him and his mentoring uh pushing me on uh, to do everything and he just challenged me and everything and the truth is that in 2008 when i got that job uh and i remember stepping on the lawn at mckinnon elementary it still brings sh uh, goosebumps to me right now to be honest with you i knew i was home it just felt like home a deja vu thing whatever you want to call it i was home and i, I knew that i was going to be here for a long career just because I love that community, still do. And so now, uh, almost 15 years later, or uh, when the opportunity came up to be super, to move up in different positions, uh, I, I said, why not? Why not me? Uh, I uh, have all the training in the world, the technical abilities, uh, and hopefully, you know, serve and uh, lead by example. Anyway, so. When Jerry announced that he was going to Santa Ana on a Sunday afternoon, you guys remember that date? <laughs> I was like in beyond shock. And uh, he said, you're good here in Colton. I said, I'll go to Santa Ana, Jerry, truthfully, for you, because I, you know, this is the kind of leader he is. And I believe in loyalty. But my loyalties are to kids, period, number one and in this district uh and i used to tell my parents or anybody on mckinley don't mess with my kids i don't care who you are parents uh anybody these are i take this honestly seriously and so uh now jerry didn't tell me in his crystal ball that there was going to be a pandemic coming i would have probably said no way man I'll, i'm good being the cbo for the district uh, led the district through some, you know, couple of challenges there and all that. Uh, and so, I, you know, the legacy piece, for me, it, we've had some great leaders that I've followed, footsteps of Dr. Fisher, Jerry Abendaris led this district for many years. For me, it's to build upon what they've already ha they have here so that in 10, 20 years, when people say, uh, you know, the people, we come and go for superintendents, right? They don't last too long in the state of California, 2.7 years, sometimes three, you know, nationwide, three years. But when, when you, I came and went and then it made a difference uh, in this community, uh, a, a difference uh, for kids, number one, because I am that kid in that classroom that grew up very poor and you guys know the story and immigrant uh, and on welfare and uh, and that loved education, loved to read. Just because I love to read, I could read at the third grade level. Uh, at, by the time I was third grade, I read. So I really thought I was smart. No, I was just, I just, I just like to read. And so uh, my legacy is, uh, you know, when kids uh, just make things happen. Colton, uh, the Colton Pride is incredible. There's nothing, no other like Colton Pride, and uh, I wear that, uh, and I take, and I live by that every single day. So, well, thank you for a great evening. You've been, a <laughs> you know, this is honestly always my favorite part of it because I get to hear a little bit about the hearts of board members, and I get to hear it a lot when I go places. And um, I counted over seventy years of service uh, this board has given through in elected service. And how long has Berenice been on the board? Started her second term, right? So, yeah, so, so fifth year. So five years? 
So that brings you up over 75 years of service. Now you need to count friends. It's part of the governance team at his end. It's a lot of service you guys have. So what drew me to being a consultant is I have two things in retirement I decided. I took six months after I retired and did try very hard to do nothing, which I've turns out I'm pretty good at. <laughs> but I did nothing for six months. Then I, I during that time I thought about how will I know a good opportunity that comes my way. And I have two simple criteria, people you may use this when you retire because it works. You will attest to this. I only want to do work that matters with people I enjoy. What we're doing tonight matters. It matters a lot. It matters for the kids in your district. It matters for you guys. You know, if a school board meeting is your worst night of the month, you're doing it wrong. So we're going to work tonight to make sure you do it right. And you come to these meetings and enjoy it because that matters. And then uh, so far, you're people I enjoy. We'll see how the night goes. But so far, <laughs> I'm liking your stories. I'm liking, I'm liking where you're at. I'm liking where your hearts are. So let's see how we can turn that into some action. A theme you each share that I hear from school boards across the state, and I heard it loud and strong here. It, it, at the end of the day, it's all about kids. It's the only reason we exist as an organization is teaching and learning. You will hear in tonight's presentation, as you go through the literature, the words moral imperative. You hear that a lot. It's a phrase that's used continually in this book. That's your ultimate guide and test. What's your litmus test for what you're doing matters as a board? If you're finding yourself spending way too much time talking about the color of the tile in the new school, uh, wouldn't it be great to have a new school by now? Um, you, you may not be following your board. Are you getting one? Well, yeah. Out? How much time are you spending talking about color of tile? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not much. You may not be hit, hitting your moral imperative. That's where you find yourself. And it's a good question to ask yourself is what we're doing about what matters most. And that's what tonight's going to be. So, oh, I'm going backwards instead of forwards. It's a bad start. So, this is the, um, I don't know how to get rid of that little gizmo at the top there. What that is. Um, this is the table of contents for your governance handbook. We're not going to painstakingly walk through each of these chapters. Uh, but I wanted you to see that, that your team has worked very hard to pull together uh, a, a good handbook that can get some of your governance standards codified. The top half are all CSBA templates. We're going to go through some of those because they really lay the foundation for your work. But then we're going to zoom in on your culture. What's going on here? What's going on in, uh, in Colton Joint that is going to uh, be specific to your vision? And how do we make sure it reflects how you really work? And if it doesn't, what are we going to do to bring it into alignment? Where am I pointing on this thing, by the way? Where's Am I appointing over you, Jamal? There we go. So you'll see, there's that's the top of the book is kind of the chapters or the, the sections of, of the governance code. It starts with what's your moral imperative? What's your unity of purpose as a board you share? That it's all about kids. What's your governance mindset? How you approach the work? And then finally, how do you govern with coherence? How do you stay coherent to those beliefs? This is CSBA's definition of what school district governance is. I'll let you read. I don't read to you too much. I might have but you'll see that last line. So it's working with the superintendent. You adopt the board. You adopt the policies and standards. The superintendent implements them. And you all make sure that there's fidelity to that and that you use all your resources to ensure success for all those things point to ensuring success. That's your moral imperative. So we know that a unified school board is made up of individuals. You have different beliefs, styles. That's all good. That's all good. I, my favorite board meeting was when there was a good, healthy conflict, right? People disagreeing and listening to each other and talking about it. And I think that's the best outcome to come. But you work together with the shared moral imperative. Even if you disagree, you share that moral imperative and you're working towards a common goal. So your trustee standards, this is on page three of your handbook. Keep learning and achievement for all students as a primary focus. I forget. Okay. Value, support, and advocate for public education. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we are the battleground right now, aren't we? The whole culture wars as the um, election years heats up, school districts, you know, culture wars is going to be the major conversation and the major battleground is going to be your public schools. So there's never been a better time for you guys to be the credible, strong board that you are. 
because um, it's, we're going to be the center of the center. It looks, it's shaping up to look like. Recognize and respect differences among yourselves. Come to enjoy and respect those different perspectives. You'll learn from it. And make sure you're doing the same with your staff, your students, your parents, and community. There is uh, such value in diversity. Act with dignity and understand the implications of demeanor and behavior. I will confess, I am a chronic eye roller. And I learned to stop that during, as, as a superintendent when that person would step up and I would catch my eyes and I had, had a director in front, I'd say, give me a look. Because it's involuntary. My eyes will roll and they can't roll. That I have to have a, I have to be dignified and respectful. The other thing I'll confess is I am the world's reddest man in a normal day. But when I get a little irritated, I glow. People think I'm having a stroke. I turn bright red. So it was very, very hard for me. You guys can be cooler. All that great melanin around this table. This white face cannot. So be, be mindful. Your, phys your expression, your smile, your resting face, right? Is it, you almost have to kind of force yourself. Israel's got a great smile. You have to keep that up for the public. You have to be, when that person is speaking, you have the, the person you like what they're saying and the person you don't like, you need to control that demeanor. Keep confidential matters confidential. There's nothing that breaks trust on a board, like coming to agreement about confidentiality, and then you hear something that, that could only have come from closed session. And it happens. It happens. But there's nothing that breaks trust further. So it's so important to keep that confidential and remember um, to not slip on that one. Parti what you're doing tonight, there's nothing that builds a board like shared learning. Going through something together and learning is the strongest thing you can do. It not only gets you better connected, but it's necessary if you're going to be informed and effective. Understand the distinction between board and staff roles. You're the policy setters. Remember when it comes to implementation and management functions, that comes to the authority of the superintendent. And um, that is probably something, maybe the more frequent conversation I had 16 years as a superintendent was to sit down with a board member or a board president who had a strong specific point of view on how something should be done, the color of the tile in the new school. And the conversation was around, thank you, let's, let's zoom out a little bit and I will take that on, I'll circle back to you, we can talk about it as a board, but number one, one board member doesn't make a decision for the board, and, um, but I'm hearing what you're saying, and let's, let's dialogue on this. Understand that authority rests with the board as a whole and not with individuals. As much as you want what you want, you gotta get it done with, in your case, four others. So I love this, this line, a unified board is made up of individuals, different styles, beliefs, common goal, but the point of this is you want a unified board, but the goal isn't to be a uniform board. The, some of the worst boards in the state are 5-0 boards. Everyone shows up, they aren't prepared, they don't read the packet, they just vote aye when it's time to vote, and they don't have many questions or much dialogue. Um, I'd much rather have a good spirited, uh, passionate group of people engaging in respectful ways to tease out points of view. So the goal is to be unified around that moral imper imperative. That doesn't mean you'll see everything the same way and it's okay not to be uniform. Now, let's talk about, about superintendent standards there, Dr. Miranda, in case you think it's all about the board. This is where sh we're uh, shining a light on you now. Jamal, I've got that thing popping up there again. I don't know if... Thank you. So there's that moral imperative, Frank, uh, promote the success of all students, keep the board and uh, work with the board to keep the district focused on learning and achievement, because there are a million and one distractions right now, and you guys know it better than anybody, taking you away from your purpose. Okay. Maybe that thing at the top, there we go. Value, advocate, and support public education, all stakeholders. And again, it falls through the same things. Act with dignity and respect. Treat everyone with civility and serve as a model for lifelong learning. Support the board's professional development as you did in, with your board presidents and putting together tonight's workshop. Work with the board as a team, always making sure you're bringing people around common purpose, keeping that, that lens focused. Recognize that um, Frank's job is to make sure that his governance team, his cabinet, the principals and all are aligned, and that they see the governance team's direction 
uh, the direction he provides is coming from the governance team. And everything is framed in, in terms of what, what your governance team, the direction they've set and aligning that district activity. Understanding authority rests with the board, but continual to provide guidance. And finally, communicate openly and with trust and integrity, providing all board members with equal access. That is rule number one in superintendent school, Frank, right? Everybody gets the same information. Everybody needs their capacity built to come in and be informed so that when it comes to that vote, you may have some questions that come up at the last minute, but you've got the basic information you need, need to make an informed, confident decision and that everybody has that. So CSBA says that your government is a cornerstone of democracy in the United States. I don't think that's overstated. This is the, you guys are the closest form of government to the people. Closer than city councils, close that school board is accessible. Um, you guys are modeling on these local boards to ensure that districts are responsive to the values and priorities of the people you represent. And there are five responsibilities. And if you flip over in your handbook to page six with me, I'm going to let you kind of read through these. And if we have any questions, we're going to get in where you guys are engaged in a minute. We got some foundational information that we're going to start talking. So we'll start with setting the, dis setting the direction for the community schools. And if you look at the bullets that fall under there, it specifies you for you what that looks like. Establishing an effective structure for your district. Providing support through your behaviors and action. Ensuring accountability to the public. And acting as community leaders. You know, the community voted to place you in here. You have a responsibility and an accountability to them. That doesn't mean you do everything your community sends you to do, right? Because you have information access that they don't. And But part of your job is to circle back and help them understand your decisions. Uh, but the toughest boards are ones that feel like they have to carry the bucket of every ad advocacy group. You want to listen to those folks, l be informed, and in some cases, carry their message because it's the right message. But when it isn't, or if it's a distraction, as a community leader, you need to have a bold stand that's well supported or direct them to staff to help you. Effective, powerful governance occurs when the board is off operating with a unified, cohesive manner where your purpose is together and it's driven by your moral imperative. And again, it's easy, the moral imperative, it's all about kids. So, oops, this takes us to this. Wait a minute, I'm gonna go back a couple, don't look. Okay, I think this thing is going, am I going forward or, sorry guys, close your eyes. Mission statement, who is it? I'm gonna read you a mission statement and I want you to determine what company this represents. It provides its customers with quality products and the expertise required for making informed buying decisions. We provide our products and services with a dedication to the highest degree of integrity and quality of customer satisfaction developing long-term professional relationships with employees that develop pride, creating a stable working environment and company spirit. What company do you think um, would be best represented by that mission statement? Apple, I've heard that. Anybody, other companies do you think could live to that lofty? Google, I've heard Google before, I've heard Amazon before. Other guesses? No, I've, I've, although I've had Walmart offered up at a board meeting too. I've also heard Amazon, people sometimes say Amazon, Nordstrom, I've heard, Toyota. This mission statement, if you don't go on the website, you will find actually belongs to Dunder Mifflin, if you ever watch The Office. And I'm not joking. There was a, there was a DunderMifflin.com website and if you went there, it's now closed, since it shows off, it's closed down. But if you went there, it had a mission statement. You could order like swag, you know, t-shirts and keychains and all the things they have. But it was set up with an HR office. It looked exactly like any business's, workshop, any business's website, including a mission statement. And I share that because a lot of districts have mission statements that are needle pointed on walls and painted on things, and, but they don't reflect the work. I don't think anybody would read that and say, gosh, that sounds like Dunder Mifflin. They had that kind of integrity and, you know, from that show. 
Um, and that is true of too many organizations that set a lofty goal, but it doesn't drive the work. It's a beautiful statement that some consultant like me came in and helped you craft. And then they, you know, laminate it, put it up and they don't audit their behavior by it. So I tell you that to caution you as we start going into your district's agreements, let's make sure these are real. And in doing so, if you would turn to page nine, and I'd like you to actually underline, so you don't have highlighter pens, underlining is fine. I want you to carefully read over what I think is one of the better written uh, design visions I've seen. And I want you to underline or highlight three sentences that especially resonate for you. And we'll give you some time to do that. And we're gonna share those out when you're done. Highlight this whole thing. <laughs> Reset to zone. Make it cut off. Start uh, mid to choose your one, one of those three. Let's kind of do a little round robin, and I'll ask you each to share a sentence, and then we'll just go around until we run out of three sentences. You may have yours mentioned already covered. For the, what, what, what's your, uh, which most resonating? Okay, on the third paragraph, um, our students will show compassion and empathy towards others who do not look like them, act like them, or agree with them. Anybody else check that one? I did too. <laughs> okay, thank you. Israel. Actually, the first sentence, uh, in Colton Joint Unified School District, we believe each student deserves the academic proficiency and skills necessary to thrive in college and in the global workforce to earn a living wage and be responsible. Anybody else choose that one? Yeah. I just chose the last half. I'm thinking of my two daughters and my son-in-laws. Earn a living wage and be responsible for that. I'm good with that. Get dad out of the equation. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Pat. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Joanna looked right past you there. We will not only be committed to hearing all students see what they need when they need it, but we will model same and respect behaviors for our students as they become graduates of the college like schools. Anybody else? Yeah. There you go. Pat, are all yours used up? <laughs> Great. That's good. Dad, you have a unity of purpose there. That's how, that's how it's supposed to work. Dad, what have you got? Our students will learn the power of making ethical decisions that propel them into success beyond high school. Do you have one, Frank, or are all yours taken up? Caring professional. Frank, did you, how'd they do? Have you got something in there that you chose that? They did fantastic. They covered yours too? 100%. I put, I love the line that, I, and I've not seen this in a vision statement like this before. Our students will advocate for themselves and thrive by asking the right questions. I love that. I mean, learning to ask the right, especially in this world of media where you can't tell which end is up sometimes, learning to ask the right questions to ferret out the closest to the truth you can get. This is a powerful statement. Just, just a quick please, comment here. Please. You know, um, in today's world, how important it is, and we talk about it within this body about communication all the time, but the line that says our students will value collaboration and adapt the communication style depending on purpose, audience, and situation. That particular skill is something that I think that will allow our students to move above and beyond as they move through. They can mm -hmm. learn that skill now and be able to express themselves. Yeah. Speak in a in a manner that is appropriate and, and speak education academically wise, you know, that would I mean take them a lot of different places. Just that skill alone. Well, and you know that the difference between our generation and the generation coming up, most of us chose a profession quite young and stuck with it. In fact, I don't even know that I had a choice, you know, that we just kind of kept going. Um, seven and eight careers will not be unusual for children coming into the workforce these days. There are jobs that they'll have in 10 years that don't even exist today. And, and the ability to have what those skills you've described will help you pivot, land in the new place, thrive, make changes, because that's that's the nature of work these days. I'm I'm not exaggerating when I say this is one of the better statements I've seen. I hope it reflects your real work. It's a good thing to revisit every once in a while and make sure that's the target. And if you see gaps between what you're reading and what you see when you visit classrooms or spend time at board meetings, that's a good conversation right there. How do we strengthen that? You know, that? Gary, it took us about three years to work on this. I, I'm not and, surprised. It was worth every minute. You know, I know Bertha and myself, we were part of this design plan. And we, you know, the questions that, that we were asking, the questions that were asked about us in our district, this does reflect in some way our district, what we're doing, and we're going there. Yeah. And this is what we're going to do to make sure that our students are successful, that our students thrive, that the students ask the right questions, but it's also making us responsible to make sure that we, as a board, as administrators in the high schools, elementary schools, middle schools, they are the examples. One of the sentences here is at the end, it says, but we will model the same expected behavior for our students as they become graduates of Colton. So we will model that. So Israel, you, you read my mind. Yes. That's where I'm going next, is your board needs to reflect and model and leave these attributes to an incredible degree. If you're gonna be bold enough to put out a vision like this, you, you have to look in the mirror. Um, I used to know when I was a principal, if I did an assembly, my assemblies used to be like chapel. You know, we'd, we'd come out and we'd have a, a character value or something we'd be talking about. It never failed. I was tested in whatever value we talked about. If I was talking to them about honesty, I would get too much change in the drive through. And I, I think, OK, that's the test. Am I going to be an honest man and just pocket that change that that poor clerk messed up? Or am I going to back my car up and say, listen, you you overpaid me, you know, I need to give you this back. And uh, I will tell you, if you're bold enough to set a vision as high as this, you will be tested in it. And and you wanna pass that test. Don't be Dunder Mifflin. Don't have a great statement and uh, 
and have your work life look real different from it. And it's that old saying, we can't hold anybody else accountable unless we're accountable ourselves. Exactly right. And by the way, and, and to that end, that's not just, it's holding yourself accountable, it's holding your colleagues accountable. Not always publicly, but there are times to have that side conversation, to meet somebody for coffee, to talk to Frank and say, Frank, we need to get Dan back in line on this one. See, Dan, Dan the everybody case. nodded when I said Usually Dan. <laughs> can, I, can I make just one? I, there's something in here that I've not seen in, in other, I'll say school districts, but I think a lot of organizations. So we mentioned a living wage twice. And whenever you mention something more than once in, in a statement like this, it usually means something. That's something a generation ago we didn't really have to talk about, right? right. We talk about jobs. And the idea was any job would be a good job to lead you to better jobs and, and you could provide for families in, in, in a lot of different jobs, but that's not the case today. And I think we do need to make these distinctions about living wages because we are in a, an economic reality where there are jobs that don't really lead anywhere or may not provide enough for you. We have the working poor. I, I run a nonprofit agency serving the homeless. Okay, there you go. A lot of folks that I serve that come for meals and food, they have jobs. They can't afford to buy groceries. They can barely get by with rent. So this is a new reality that even I, you know, when I was a student, we didn't talk a lot about that. You know, job was a job. Just go get a job and we'll work and you'll you'll be okay. It's not the case anymore. So I think we need to adopt more of that language in in our philosophy and in obviously the pedagogy that we have when we talk about setting standards. You know, Dan, that's right. Because a lot of our students, when we when I go speak to them, and I don't know if it's happened to my colleagues here, but they always ask, so how much do you make? Right. Always. Always. You know, how much do you make? Or do you have a living wage? You know, they'll ask those questions. And that's part of what the world is now. And 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 I'm, I'm glad that Dan brought that up because we do say it here twice. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and, and to your credit, um, I'm just completing my second search for a superintendent for an ROPRC. I'm working with Cryrop now. I just finished up with one in Torrance. And it really opened my eyes to making sure that there are robust alternative paths for students who may not have the blessing of being able to go right into college or may choose not to, but maybe need to work a few years, save up some money. The, the, the fellow we just hired over in Torrance uh, went right out of high school, was immature, didn't feel ready. He went and joined an adult ed program and got into behavioral health and made a high skilled high uh, income job for 10 years that then afforded him to go, uh, gave him the resource to go back to college and he graduated without debt with a, with his undergraduate master's degree. There are lots of paths that we have to make kids aware of. Bertha, do you have something to add? She's dying to, she's trying to get her mic going. <laughs> I do. Um, <laughs> Please. Yeah, um, like Israel said, you know, we spent, uh, it was over three years ago, we spent days and days and days and hours and hours uh, wordsmithing and 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 uh, getting different um, stakeholders involved in how to develop this. Um, we had classified, we had community members, we had uh, principals, we had directors. Um, you know, we had parents. So it was you know uh, laborious, and sometimes it was sometimes painful because sometimes sometimes someone would feel strongly about something, so we would have to talk about it. Um, and you know, the the final product I, I was very happy with. My my um, vision is to make this come alive at any time possible, any possible opportunity. And I think we could do a lot better job ourselves mm -hmm. with that. Um, because I know some of the principals have taken this and in their at their staff meeting have and they should. Yeah. It's a great conversation for staff. Part and what does this mean? So my my vision is to make this mm -hmm. document come alive yeah. so that everybody knows. So the students know, what does it mean by to, by being a, a risk ta taker? What does it mean by having integrity? You know, um, so all these words in here, they should be able to come to life. And a way to approach that, sometimes, Bertha, I couldn't agree more. You, This is huge. It's kind of long to put on a t-shirt, right? So it's a hard <laughs> message to pass on. However, taking it and saying, taking a year and saying, you know, where's the biggest gap in this between where we are and where we want to be? Is it in communication? Is it in that high wage earning or living wage earning? Also, or from the reverse side, the appreciative inquiry approach is where is it we're really hitting it out of the park?
You know, Gary, we took we took this and we created the Keeping Students First Achievement Equity and Wellness. We can put that on a T-shirt. That will go on a T-shirt beautifully. But, but you know, yeah. when we we were working on this, and that's why it's in individual paragraphs. Mm -hmm. The individual, you know, it's not a big old thing because as you read it, that statement, the next statement, the next statement that we're making, and it might have one or two in it. So as you read it. It's simple, it's easy, you understand what you're coming from. And that was the goal, <clears throat> is that everybody would understand what we're trying to bring to the table. And you know, Israel, it's also very resilient. Yes. This could have been written 10 years ago and it could have been written 10 minutes ago. Yes. It kind of, you'll never get there. I mean, you'll you'll close the gap, you'll work hard, but it's a it's a moving target. And um, and that's kind of how you want your vision to be. The only thing I'll add to this is that <clears throat> When, when you look at the vision statement, some people say it's too too long, robust, and all that. What this vision statement, I think what we try to capture is it's about relationships. You see that in there? The identity, what do we want our district to stand for? And you see that in there. And, and it's awesome because about it talks about integrity, risk-taking, living wage that Dan brought up. I mean, earning you know, living wage. And and so that's critical before you get into uh, systems uh, redesign or designing process systems. If you don't have the relationships, you don't have the mindset, you don't have the culture, it, it won't happen. No. It, and so that's why it's, really good it's like that. So it, well, there are so a lot of thought into it. I, I, I'm sitting here reading this thinking, boy, I, if I really believe this, my principal's meetings would have looked different if I was leading with fidelity to this. The conversations would have been different. Joanne set through some principles. I mean, she knows exactly what I'm talking about. They don't always meet this standard. Seldom, I'll say. You know, Gary, and our goal was so that our students succeed. We have a line in here. It says, our students will learn the power of making ethical decisions that propel them into success beyond high school. That is our yeah. goal. Yeah. We want our students to succeed, have a living wage, as we were talking about. And uh, that is the goal. I'm glad you guys recognize what a monumental tool this is. I, I'm really impressed. I seldom see it. And I work with a lot of school boards. Could I make, make a quick comment? Of course you may, sir. Please. You know, as we take a look, there's actually five different passages in this vision mm -hmm. here. And with that, what we could do, if you guys recall how they used to put all these metaphors on on posters and you would see different posters all over the place we could actually break each one of these passages into an individual poster so it's continuing reading so that at the schools you know you read one it may capture your 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 will to read the next one and the next one so we're talking about what bertha was saying to try to get this out there so it could be something that our students read our faculty reads and something that's visible to the community. And that could be one way we bring it up, not put the whole thing, because when it seems like it's too much, nobody wants to read it. But if we break it up into five different posters and we frame them and we put them throughout mm -hmm. our, our, uh, our buildings, our schools, people are more likely to read those segments mm -hmm. and start having a better understanding and maybe, you know, start uh, implementing some of these on their own or trying to make a movement. Yeah, how do you operationalize? How do you communicate it and operationalize it? And that's a that's one way to do it for sure. So we're going to move into, this is where everybody gets to take a hard look at themselves in the mirror. You're going to be doing your own report card. So highly effective governance team requires well-defined infrastructure that gives you definition, guidance, and direction. So we're going to look at your... Um, team of uh your team unity of purpose it's on page eight so i'm just going to ask you and this is individual and in your own little head you can share it is something if you have something to share otherwise just reflection so do you model the following behaviors are you prepared when you come to board meetings i mean you can't be 100 percent prepared on everything but on the big ideas that matter most have you taken the time to prepare are you the board member I don't even know, do you have board packets anymore? Is it all online? Do you still have paper packets? My least favorite, do you, <laughs> Joad does. My least favorite sound in the days of paper was hearing the board members rip open the envelope with the board packet as the board meeting was started. 
That was my least favorite. And I always thought, okay, you better vote yes on everything. You don't get to vote no on anything if you didn't prepare for the meeting. You just go along with the crowd. So be prepared. So think about that. Are you prepared? You know, that that one of the challenges of being a veteran board member is you can get sloppy as you as things go forward. You have to kind of go back and get that initial energy and make sure that you're you're putting the energy in that you put in that first year you were a trustee. We're, we're prepared because we get a phone call from the superintendent prior to the meeting. So he's like, You can't not any, be prepared. Do you have any questions? Anything on, on the agenda, on the board docs, anything? So we yeah. need to be prepared. There you <laughs> go. Be courteous. That's kind of, kind of challenging. Think about that. When, when that time in the board meeting comes where you're hearing something in a staff presentation that you don't like, you are hearing something from the board member, a board colleague that either you don't understand or you don't support. Um, are you courteous in the way you approach it? Again, we're modeling. Um, kids aren't seeing um, courtesy in, out of government anymore. I, I'm so, so sorry to say. Um, hopefully they do at your board meetings. So audit that and audit each other. Give each other permission after a meeting. You know, Israel takes Bertha's side and said, you know, Bertha, you were a little harsh. And I don't think you meant to be. I say that because I can't imagine Bertha being harsh, but I bet she's got that in her. <laughs> Is that's a that's a great side conversation. Sometimes you have to do it in real time. You know, sometimes the president may have to say, "Let's take a breath," and um, you know, remember our civility policy. But that's unusual. More often, it's more subtle than that. But have those conversations and be open to getting feedback from your colleagues. Um, just. In general, be good citizens and all that that means. Take personal responsibility. You know, when they say when things go right, uh, good leaders look out the window and they look at people to give credit to. When things go wrong, leaders look in the mirror and not out the window and they say, what, how could I have done that better? What did I do to contribute to that problem? And how can I be a part of a solution? Be informed. Part of what the richness you guys bring is you all have different constituents. You belong to different clubs and associations. You read different magazines. You watch different news shows. Being informed and being that voice that brings information, even as you have today, I've, some of the history and background about how that was developed was, is insightful for some of the people that weren't on that committee to hear the deliberate, deep work you did that, that resulted in that. Be trustworthy to each other and the community that elected you into your positions. You want to be competent, but not competent without character. Either one of those alone um, doesn't fare too well for people. So give yourself a mental grade on that one. You know, maybe you get an A on some of them, maybe not so much. Maybe you set a personal goal in there. You know, I'm going to work on being more prepared or taking more responsibility for things. So maybe reflect a little bit for your individual work. Then going off to your team unity of purpose, your shared purpose to have the best learning environments for all students. And the only way you can do that by having clear, meaningful goals and maintaining focus on those goals. Here's the challenge. You want to remain open to input, but you don't want to change course with every piece of input that comes your way. And sometimes that's harder to do than it sounds. Um, I'm working in a district now. We're actually doing a superintendent search where they've had a couple of interims. And the principals have said the board has gotten out of their lane. You know, without a superintendent there to kind of run that information through, there are uh, board members picking up the phone and calling principals and high school principals and saying, you need to stop doing that. I got a call from my neighbor. She stopped me at Vaughn's. That book shouldn't be in a classroom. And before you know it, the board is directing staff and staff is saying, okay, we do, do we listen to this one board? You know, how, who are we taking our direction from? So, um, and if every one of those phone calls to you becomes a shift in what's going on, the organization won't, there, it'll be paralyzed. People get stuck and they'll play safe. So base your decision on a thorough evaluation of facts and not on emotion personal bias or public pressure, and boy, are you guys under some public pressure right now. Um, I don't know specifically in Colton because I haven't followed your board meetings, but you, you watch the same shows I do. You talk to your colleagues at CSBA. If you go to Masters in Governance, um, you hear the stories of school boards that are just 
Maybe they've been decades of places of peace and good solid work that are just torn asunder right now and working through the challenges of bringing new people in. And a lot of that is because of a gallery of people with strong opinions. It's wonderful to have people show up with strong opinions, but the board really needs to be cohesive about how that information is taken in, how you process it, how you stick to your moral imperative. Otherwise you'll be buffeted by every fresh wind that comes your way. And there's a lot of wind out there right now for so many people. So what do you do when you disagree? You resolve it through dialogue, not argument. If it starts sounding like an argument, you start sounding like your kids at home, you probably are getting off course. It's an exchange of ideas or opinions, but your goal in that isn't to be heard. Your goal is to reach agreement. And two, we know that what happens so often, and uh, I will own this one, is that while you're talking, I'm formulating my next thought. I'm probably not listening, Pat. So when, when I'm hearing input, it's like, I'm thinking, okay, when she's done talking, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to say next. And it's some that gets you nowhere. That gets everybody being positional, um, listening to the issue and in your mind thinking, okay, I'm going to really hear this. Cause I think there's going to be a third, there's going to be a place we're going to go together on this. It's going to be better than where I thought it was going to go or where Pat thought she was going to go. And we're going to find that alternative and it's going to be a little messy. Might take a, more than one meeting, but we're going to be courteous and cordial, and we're going to work it out until we get there. And again, those are like my favorite board meetings. I love when I see a trustee come into a meeting. I'm thinking of a situation in Desert Sands where someone came in and made a very firm resolve statement of position. The board started talking in about two minutes. She said, you know what? Thank you. Uh, I hadn't thought about it that way. I'm going to support this issue. And she came in opposed to something. And I, I wanted to stop the meeting and just say, everybody, Look what just happened. This is how it's supposed to work. She had good reasons for her position, but she didn't have all the reasons. And because she listened and heard it, she changed her position right in the middle, proudly. And um, too often we get entrenched in our point of view, and it's hard to let go of your position because you feel like you lost. When in truth, she won big time, at least in this superintendent's eyes. So you have that, you have all that great work I talked about, but you don't find the third alternative. And so you finally take the vote and it goes on a 4-1 or a 3-2. What do we do then? And that's what this addresses. For unity of purpose, you speak with one voice once decisions are made. You collectively support them and move to implementation. So you may not have been a great supporter of a school bond issue that's going to go forward. Maybe you had a minority opinion on that. Once the board supermajority says, you know what, we're going to have a school board, a school bond, then your, your, you, your voice joins, joins that of the majority and you support it. That doesn't mean you have to you know, go on TV and sell it, but you don't undermine it. You don't hang on to your point of view. You don't go on a Facebook page or social media and undermine it. You support the board's direction. And if you feel like you just can't or there's new information to come forward, you talk to your superintendent, you agendize it and you revisit it. Maybe there's new information that'll be helpful for everybody to know. Uh, when you're unified, you're not a distraction to the work. When I shared with you that other board, the board that wasn't unified, it was such a distraction that, that uh, at a time when they're coming back with learning gaps from a pandemic, principals saying, we just can't, we can't juggle all these competing interests right now and keep our eye on the target of student achievement. So don't be that board. Be the board that really comes together, even when you disagree, once that decision is made, you're, you're focused. Any questions about that? Is that, can you think of a situation where that's been a case where there's a divided point of view. It was hard to move past. Some of you have been on the board a while. Have you got one, Pat? I don't, I don't think I've ever seen this particular board. We don't, we don't argue about issues. I mean, we discuss, but I don't think I've ever seen us argue. So. I mean, you know, we don't always agree on everything and not every, you know, vote is 7-0, but, but there's not, you know, we discuss things and, and, and our opinions on how we feel, but we don't argue. Okay, thank you. Everybody agree? That, yeah? I, I can give an example. Oh, no, no, it, it, an example of, of the previous board member, so he's not here, I could talk about him. Um, <laughs> 
And shall rename name. Right. Shall rename name. No, we all remember Pilar. Pilar was a great guy. Um, and Pilar made it very clear he didn't like lawyers. He was <laughs> never going to vote for a, a contract or a raise or uh, anything for had to do with lawyers. And that's just where I'm at, Dan. That's he, he vote, do you remember that? And, you? and you know, of course, I don't agree with him. I'm a guy who thinks, hey, lawyers, you need them. They keep you out of trouble. You got to have them. Right. But I respected where he was coming from. And going to that meeting, I knew he was going to be a, a no vote. And, and that's OK, because he explained where he was coming from and and, and why he felt that way and about the need to it's a great you know, example. Be, so you can have a disagreement. You can even under, disagree fundamentally with somebody. But their approach and your approach towards that can still make it cordial. And I actually respected him a great deal um, because I think he was very honest and, and coming from an honest place. So that was, I remember that conversation with him because he was a no vote. Yeah. If it came to the lawyers, get him out. <laughs> that, that's a great example. It was a principle he held deeply. And, and you wouldn't expect him to go any different. I had a board member that voted no on my first contract when I was being hired. Met with her and she said, um, you know, Gary, I just ran for school board on the, you know, a platform that the superintendent made too much money. And you're coming in making what the other superintendent made. I can't flip five, you know, two months. And I said, okay, here's my question. Am I the right superintendent as far as you're concerned? She said, absolutely. I said, okay, so you're going to vote no on my contract, which I respect. You can't, How do you flip? But is this going to be an ongoing issue for us the whole time we work together? And she said, 100% no. And she was true to her word. True to her, we had a great relationship, and I respected her position, and she was kind enough to fill me in, and I wasn't surprised at a board meeting. My board member voting no on my contract, it just came down to dollars. And what do you do? In this case, I wish you would have voted yes, but still, it's still my check still cleared so all worked out <laughs> so guidelines for surviving on the board and and pat says you 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 don't argue uh, i bet things have gotten tense a time or two wouldn't be surprised it would be an unusual board if you didn't under the under the uh circumstance we're all living on so how do you get along when you individual trustees for whatever reason find it difficult to find common ground it can jeopardize the ability to develop a unified, cohesive governance team, or at least create the perception you don't have one. So it's incredibly important for the board not to give up too easily. Every once in a while, I'll see a board president push for that vote a little too fast, right? You know, let's get, let's move on. It's like, no, no, let them chew on a little bit. You know, let's take a little, little time. There's not agreement here. Let's, let's work and see if we can get it. Um, so what are some things to remember? Reserve your judgment. It's okay to have a point of view. If you're prepared, you've earned a point of view. But reserve that final judgment and really listen to the, to the conversation and dialogue. It may bring, bring a fresh perspective to you. Listen empathetically. In one of my little, on my desk, and I, I'll forget it now, but it says, um, you know, when you learn that that person's problem has no, more to do with them than it does with you, you can have grace. So that person who's so angry at the board has a whole context they're coming from that has nothing to do with you. They're yelling at you, but really it's not about you. And then once you accept that, you can have some grace and say, okay, boy, they're, this is hard. They really are passionate about this. And instead of recoiling, I'm going to lean in and really listen and, and see what I can learn from them. Stay focused on the content, not their behavior or style. That, that's powerful. That's something, Frank, is when some, the angrier they got, I'm thinking negotiations time maybe when everybody's in the audience with black armbands and they're saying terrible things about the board and about you, you know, um, I would always lean in and not instead of, because your tendency is to think, yikes, right? And back up a little bit. I lean in and be as open and open up my body, you know, my arms and just receive what I was hearing. And that's a powerful message you put out without saying a word of, I really want to hear you. You don't have to yell. I, I want to hear what you have to say. Maybe there's something in here. Um, remember as board to, to lean in and as be as neutral as you can, right? If you're going to smile and nod when somebody speaks and scowl when the next one comes up, that's not a great, that's not a great look for anybody. Always be true to the norms of the board. You've got, you've got your norms for your behavior on the board. Stick to those. Don't take differences personally. And if all else fails, so you're having that conversation, you've chewed on it, Joanne has held that gavel and thought not allowed herself to move to the vote, but it's just not going to get a breakthrough. 
you've got the guy who's going to vote no on it. You can explain the value of attorneys all day long. Um, he has his point of view. He's earned it, and he's not about to change it. Um, then it's important to move forward, as it sounds like you did as a board. You move forward. You take that point of view. It's on record. You move forward, and you, and you do your governance responsibilities. You can't get hung up forever on those issues. So we're going to play a little game. Get out a pen or pencil and uh, just find a piece of paper somewhere. And I'm going to ask you to match these up. Whose motto is celebrating animals confronting cruelty? Write down who you think that might be. Explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. Pretend like there's a sumptuous prize at the end of this contest. So you take it seriously, people. Lean in here. I want to hear some good answers. Explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. What organization might have that as their motto? Oops. This one you should get. We grant the wishes of children with life-threatening medical conditions to enrich the human experience with hope, strength, and joy. We grant the wishes of children. There's a clue in there. Improving life one breath at a time. Spreading ideas, a two word vision statement, spreading ideas. You're going, everybody can sing this like a good neighbor, right? La, 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 right there. There you go. <laughs> That's really good at earworm when you can sing it and remember it. That's a, that was a smart logo. Someone should have made a lot of money on that. By the way, there'll be bonus points if you can answer a question on who wrote. Oh, shoot. See, I got a little problem here. Let me go back. Who wrote the, lo, the, 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 the song, Like a Good Neighbor? Bonus points? Anybody know? If you think you know, write it down. I'll tell you at the end. You all know who wrote that song. You just don't know you know it. To lift the spirits of America's troops and their families. And the last motto, keeping students first, achievement, equity, wellness. Okay. I would have you exchange lists and grade each other's papers, but I won't do that. You can grade your own. But I'm going to fail anyway. <laughs> Frank, what are we going to? Frank's going to have to stay after school today. Celebrating animals confronting cruelty. Anybody have the Humane Society? Maybe did you have the ASPCA? Maybe yeah, could have been. Could have been that as well. I'm going to give you a, a half a point for that because that's close enough. Explore, enjoy, and protect the planet is the Sierra Club. Yeah, okay, there you go. Could have been Greenpeace. I thought of that. That's another one people often say. Granting the wish. Who's that? Make a wish foundation. Yeah. Improving life one breath of the, at a time is the American Lung Association. <laughs> Joanne. A charter every member. Every day. A charter member sending off a check. There you go. Spreading ideas, Ted. Right? Ted Talks. Yeah. Yeah. Ted Talks. Yeah. Ted Talks is a. It's like a, a podcast, if you will. I'm not there. <laughs> Clearly, you haven't, that idea hasn't spread as far as reaching Joanne. So, like a good neighbor. State Farm, bonus points. Who wrote the jingle? Barry Manilow. Yes, Barry Manilow did. What other songs did Barry Manilow write? What other jingles? He wrote the Oscar Mayer Wiener song, and he wrote the I Am Stuck on Band Aids. That's why I'm like, those earworms were all Barry Manilow. Yeah, he was a jingle writer, a jingle writer. Yep. To lift the spirits of America's troops and their families, the USO, right? And how about keeping students first? Achievement, equity, wellness. CJUSD. CJUSD it is. <laughs> That's what's going on in your t-shirts and across Pat's hat or Joanne's hat over there too. Okay. Yes. But here's my, my all time favorite um, slogan I've ever seen anywhere. Who, which, who, which of my friends here are Spanish speakers? 
Want to hear my horrible Spanish? Here we go. This is college level Spanish. Lava cada coche como si fuera a llevar a los novios a su boda. Lava cada coche como si fuera a llevar a los novios a su boda. What's that mean? Want the car as if you were taking your loved ones to to their uh, wedding. So I was sitting. That is Huntington Beach car wash. There's a car wash at Beach and Ellis in Huntington Beach that always has a line that runs down the street. It's because they take so much time with each car and because if you're going to go out on a date or if you're going to take somebody to the prom, that's where you go. It's maybe a $35, $40 car wash. But inside, I'm sitting there one day waiting because you wait a long time there. And I looked and I saw they had their uh, vision not where where the public could see it, but where the workers could see it. And it was wash each car as if, and I'm sitting using my mental ALM Spanish from college. The only, the word that I was, I had everything except boda. I didn't, I didn't know the word wedding. That wasn't, that wasn't familiar to me. I didn't knew, have, that was before Google Translate, a long, long time ago. And I thought, what a compelling and beautiful message. And no wonder I love that car wash. If they really wash a car like they're taking, that's a great mental model to have. You would do your work differently. If you knew you were taking sweethearts to their wedding. Don't know what that means or what that's like. Completely. Completely. Exactly. So we're moving on. And by the way, we're gonna we'll wind up it's about 10 to 5, maybe another 15, 20 minutes. We good? Everybody hanging in? We're gonna get some richer stuff. So I'm gonna move through some of this stuff a little faster to get some meat. Look at those good looking folks. Your code of ethics and your standards of conduct. Go to page 11. Frank, we need to update your picture. We got to get you a glamour shot. Prior to COVID. <laughs> we need to get you a glamour shot that looks like everybody else's. A little more face, a little less body in that. Yeah. Okay, the code of ethics shall apply to all members of the board. Our conduct and behavior, these are your norms. These are your agreements about behavior. And I want you to take a minute of, of that and read. The, the important part is how you put that into action, what you will do and what you agree you will not do or what you'll avoid. So if you look at page 11, take a look at those bu- bullets under we will. And I'm going to ask you just, we don't have to, everyone doesn't have to have one, but look at one that maybe you want to discuss a little bit and talk about how it relates to your board action. So I'll give you some time to read. So I t- took notice of the paragraph leading into the we will, because as, as districts across the state moved into trustee areas, as you did, and you maybe have done it a while longer than most, but many districts have entered that world in the last few years. But the district, while you are elected by geographic regions of your community, when you get to the dais, you represent all students. You're loyal to every kid in the district, every corner of the district. When there's resources to be allocated, allocated you don't... Um, wrestle over which trustee area is going to get more or less. It's about where's the need. And everybody gets around making sure that the resources are addressed where there is the most need. Oh, I'm sorry. Hybrid district, so we are oh, I... that is unique. I kind of like it. Yeah. Right, and it may, and and frankly, it it's a little more work because your target area to be a costs a lot more. But you haven't got a you haven't got an area, a new a person with a strong point of view that may not be healthy or productive. It's harder for them to get in. Yep, yep. Oh, I kind of like it. Thank you. I don't know that I knew that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, we've looked into it for. Well, you kind of meet you. You probably won't get the letter. 
on that because you're already in trusty areas. It's just how it's elected. So you're pretty immune to those suits that a lot of us weren't immune to and went to trusty areas. Anybody have anything particularly of note under the we wills, agreements about your standards of conduct? Read it for us, please. The first sentence, work together in a spirit of harmony, respect, and cooperation, despite differences of opinion, taking full responsibility for our actions and conduct. I love that personal audit piece. That's the look in the mirror part. And being open to other people saying, you know, maybe you need to look in the mirror on this one and audit your behavior a bit. Any other thoughts? That's something you especially, I saw you underlining, Bertha. Did you have something? That caught your eye? We will give the staff and the respect and consideration. Yeah. So when you have a cabinet member addressing the board um, to make sure that the board grants them the appropriate attention and respect, is that? Mm -hmm. Your cabinet will love to hear that that's a priority because that's a that can be a really tough place to be in front of that dais, especially if you're delivering a message, you know, is not going to be popular. <laughs> and that's there's too many of those to be delivered right now. One thing that um, when we live in our certain areas. You know, thank in, you in our in our areas, um, I really fall back on all students and that gives me the confidence and to, to stand up to anyone really because if a certain community says we're gonna well you know we want this done this way well okay but we're here for all students and capitalize a l l we're here for all students not just pockets that's that moral imperative isn't it and sometimes that's hard for um some people to hear but it's important that we do that. Right, right. How about we will avoid? Here, these are the pitfalls the boards can fall into. Top of page 12, I know we've shined, I'll sh I've shined a line on that once already, I'm gonna do it again. The critical role of board members as policy makers and direction setters and accountability folks, as opposed of implementers or operational people. Um, you know, there are times when you really wanna go down there and you know, you've heard there's a problem in the bathrooms at Colton High School and you wanna go down there and see who's vaping and who isn't and because you heard about it at Vons and, to understand that 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 while that I that um, observation or perception is something absolutely be shared, what you don't want to do, do is haul yourself on down to Colton High School and stand outside a bathroom and see what's going on. As much <laughs> as you may be tempted to do that, uh, oh, I, I say that because that's a real example. Not Colton High School; it's a real example, and, and board members do it for the right reason. Like I'm going to get down there and be a part of the solution. It never works too well. It never works too well. It's a role you don't want to be in. You want to, but you can hold your superintendent accountable for bringing back a report, for um, taking action if action is needed, and at least for clarifying. Not everything you hear at Vons is happening just the way you heard it. Um, but this, that's a very fair thing to bring the superintendent's attention. And part of what, uh, honestly, uh, that Dr. Miranda's role is, is to help board members know the difference sometimes and to set that limit. Doesn't sound like you have to do it too often in this group. The next session, I'm, section I'm gonna not go into, this is your homework. This is the specific practices around effective governance meetings. These are the agreements about how, how an item gets pulled from an agenda, requesting information. These are the practices that, um, that Joanne and Frank especially need you to understand when it comes to your input in developing a board agenda your behavior during a board meeting. I'll give you one that is often misused by boards. Number nine, voting no or abstaining. 
very often, especially, and I'll, I'll use the example around masking time, people who are uncomfortable uh, taking a vote on something that was gonna be unpopular, abstaining from the boat, vote. Well, an abstention is only if you have a conflict of interest and that's defined in the law. Um, you can vote no or say, I'm unprepared, I'd like to table this. I think we need more information. That's a fair position. But you really can't abstain just because you don't want to go on record. And during masking, especially, I saw a lot of boards doing that. We had a lot of workshops around. It's hard, but you kind of have to come down with the position on that. There's no conflict of interest on wearing a mask that I'm aware of, unless you own the mask company, I guess. <laughs> then it could be, could be. Um, so I think that the, these are worth reading, reminding yourself, making sure you're adhering to those guidelines, but it's all around the formation of governance meetings. And I want to take our last time together and go into your protocols. So as part of the governance culture, protocol should be reviewed on a regular basis. This is really the heart of every governance handbook because this drills down to where you guys live. And so we're going to walk through the proposed protocols. They're on pages eight, start on page 18. and goes to the end. And this is our last chunk today. So your protocols are written on visiting school sites, handling concerns from public and staff, individual trustee requests for action, giving direction to staff, governance team communication, and speaking to the public or social media. When you talk about coherence on a board and the importance of coherence, this is what it comes down to. Your coherence is found in your practices. So what are your agreements? Let's start with, um, visiting school sites. Take a minute and read over that. And I'll ask the question, do you support this protocol? Is there, do you see a need to change or revise it? That will be on page 18. Basically, it's saying, give a heads up. If you're going to be on a school site, you're welcome on this school site. Nobody's looking to block you. But give the superintendent's office a couple days notice. Let him make sure that they're aware you're coming. It works for a couple of reasons. Number one is you have no idea how disruptive your presence is. You don't mean to be because you're, you know, you're just Bertha. You're just Dan. Come to school. You're just Frank. No, you're not. You're the you're trustee Flores. Trust, well, Flores and Flores. And, um, <laughs> Uh, Frank and Frank. And when you come on campus, it, it's disruptive, not necessarily in a bad way, but having knowing you're coming, knowing you're going to be expected, knowing your purpose really helps maintain um, the sanctity of those classrooms. Everybody OK with that one? Does that sound like a one you can support? Dan? It is I, if, another layer to add to that, which is even more important today, is the security element. All of us need to be at a heightened level of who's on our campuses, are they there for a purpose? Have they checked in? So the days of us, even though we're well known, walking through and just saying hi, we have to wear our badges. We we need to check in. We need to model that behavior because we're more acute than ever. And you hear those terrible stories of, well, how did that person get on campus? Well, we we know him or her. Or we know that individual. Sam Bernardino was the spouse of a longtime teacher, and we know what happened. And in, in, yeah, uh, so. We have to be vigilant about the security aspect as well and model that even as board members. So that's something I'm very cognizant of having little ones in school, well, all of us, but all of our kids. I, that's a great reminder because sometimes even as superintendent, I've gone on a campus and first off, you have like an office sub or something and the world doesn't know, especially at Desert Sands. I mean, there's 30 schools. Uh, I will walk in. I was just some old guy walk, walk into the building. I might have had a suit on, but they would stop and say, I'm sorry, can I help you? And I'd say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Gary Rutherford. I'm kind of embarrassed at this point because I should have stopped and signed in. And I walked in there like I own the place. So trustees, remember that. They're kind of like, Joanne. The other issue for that is, uh, the other issue for that is uh, if, in case of emergency, if you had an earthquake, they had to know who was on campus. And if you got people on campus and they're somewhere, right. you need to know where to look for them. 100%. So we're good with the, with the school visits. That can be, this can be a point of contention for people sometimes so okay how about handling concerns from the public 
If take a minute and read that over. Concerns is a polite word for complaints, usually, when a complaint comes your way. See a section for Nintendo Power. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a norm for that. We're pretty good at those. You have to pass complaints on to the superintendent. Compliments you can keep to yourself. They're for you. <laughs> Brought back a compliment. Sorry. I was, did I miss something else? I heard that part. I'm just playing with you. So there are some magic words for this one. You know, that um, people will stop you and they don't really understand your authority as a board member. They, they think you're the person that can help them because the teacher, you know, is, the kid got a C on a spelling test and they really think it should have been an A or on the essay. Um, there's some magic words. Thank you for bringing that to my attention is always a good one. Even if you're not grateful at all for them bringing. I see Joanne nodding because she uses that all the time, I'm sure. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, uh, then direct them. If it's something pretty perfunctory, you can say, have you taken that? Have you talked with your child's teacher about that? That would be their other principal. Um, last resort. You know, if why don't you write an email to the superintendent and copy me on it? Uh, I'll let, you know, Dr. Miranda know that this is coming his way because I think he might want to hear about this and be able to help you. Now, the truth is that call will get to Joanne and Joanne will do her level best effort to get that to the right person because Frank's pretty useless in dealing with most things as I was as superintendent. They're calling me to get help on the playground. Yeah, there's nobody much more useless than the superintendent to be able to fix that problem. But I can get them to the people and get their attention. Often when people come to you for whatever reason, sometimes they're feeling, well, they come to you for a couple of reasons. One is they, they were blown off or they feel like they were. Somebody didn't take my issue seriously enough. My kid's being bullied and nobody is, you know, I don't think it's being taken seriously. And you can help with that. The other is just somebody that just thinks maybe it's a shortcut. If I go to Dan, he can get this, instead of taking the time to go down to the school, I'll just have Dan use the board member Trump card to fix it for me. And, um, and once you start that, there's no end to it. So you gotta be very careful and I know you know that. But the magic words, thank you for bringing that my attention. Let's see if we can get you to somebody who can help you on this. And guide them and don't walk away with it on your back. Direct that person how they can solve their own problems if that's doable. It's also completely fine and sometimes necessary for you ask Frank to circle back. Frank, I'm, you know, this, I'm sent this mother your way. She's really upset about uh, these kids that are chasing her kid home from school every day. Can you let me know what you find out from that? Because I may bump into her again, or it's a neighbor. That's a, that's a very fair thing to circle back so that you're equipped um, to respond. Page 19, the middle, individual trustee requests for action. Take a minute and read that one over. I have a question regarding um, this this one here. There's a majority vote and there's also consensus. So but you use it for what? Yeah. So um, that's more of an art than a science. Something like a handbook can be adopted and you can take action and adopt it on a 5 0 vote or whatever the vote is. You can also say, is there consensus? You know, we've done some revisions. We're bringing this back for a second. Consider is there consensus from the board that this is our handbook? doesn't really require action, but most often boards will, will prefer um, taking an action because it makes it very official. Like we have all agreed, and this is gonna go on the website and be our agreed statement. But consensus can be used in discussions usually. Like you're doing a straw poll, you're getting a sense. Your action isn't gonna come out of it, you're getting consensus around. Bertha says, I would really like a staff report on the color of the tile on the men to use my overused example. Uh, is there consensus from the board that that should be brought back for consideration? Crickets. It's not back, brought back for consideration. That's the case where you don't have a vote, but you're seeking board consensus. 
that was birthed as single interest. Nobody else wants to spend more time talking about it. It's dead without a vote. That help? Okay. Giving direction to staff. I'll let you take a minute and read through that. Well, the second bullet says it all. <laughs> yep. The three. Yep. The three points. That's the stay in your lane conversation that that a superintendent of a trustee sometimes have or trustees have with each other of let's remember the roles, remember the guidance, and and we can't have everybody giving direction to staff. Um, and by the way, good superintendents, we tell our principals. I'm going to go back to that first one, visiting school sites. If one of you does show up, the phone rings. And the superintendent's office, they tell Joanne, you know, uh, Mr. Fuentes is visiting campus. Just want to let you know he's here today for our awards assembly. Now, that doesn't get anybody in trouble, but I always like to know if trustees are out and about on campus. And it might be a conversation I have. Oh, Israel, I heard you went by and were at the school the other day going to the awards assembly. Yeah, my nephew is getting an award. Hey, you're, you, you can go to those things. You're not really in official capacity. But boy, Mr. Fuentes, let me know the next time you're going because the principal can introduce you. Remember, you're elected at large. Never hurts a bit for people to know that you're out and about on campuses. So let us know ahead of time, and there are ways you can guide that. They'll call you in a hot second, as will a cabinet member who's being directed by a board member. Well, and should come back and say, okay, I got a weird call from you know, uh, Mrs. Thoring Ojeda, we need to talk about it because she has a point of view about something. And are you aware that she's, you know, and that's that's how staff, will, so I guess I'm saying is you'll get caught either way. So you might as well do it right. It's great practice. So you can see the importance of having these protocols written when you've got a good, healthy board that's kind of staying, doing the right things, because you'll probably get somebody elected at some point that either is so new they don't understand that because they're brand new, they don't understand their role yet. I did a workshop in a district, and the, the, um, at the end I said, well, what'd you learn today? And one of the brand new board members said, I learned that um, I need to get a job. <laughs> she said, I thought when I ran for board, and she meant it, I thought I'd have an office and a desk and I'd be expected to come in work every day. And she was completely caught by surprise that her role was um, more guidance and direction. She really thought it was like a company car kind of job. So she had a little bit of a rude awakening. I know you guys get those huge stipends, yeah. but aside from that, right? Yeah, yeah. Governance team communication. These are the agreements about how, when we said before, all trustees get the same information, that's kind of captured as part of this element. But also being aware that uh, there's the, um the limit of how many board members could speak to each other as uh, in one se uh, separate topic, you know, because uh, I know that when anybody calls me, one of the first questions I do ask them is, who have you spoken to about it? And if they say so, 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 and so, and so, I said, well, I can't talk to you about it because you've already talked to three people. So your brown act, what a serial board meeting might look like. And then finally, the last one of your protocols falls under best practice around, um, you know, who's the district spokesperson? Do you guys have a PIO? Do you, have a, you do. Someone who's appointed to do that. <laughs> We're looking at her. How you doing there, Keith? <laughs> Good. Boy, that's a big job. And so the board agrees, you know, what, what is really a challenge is when individual trustees peel off and especially when the big issues happen and they will the phone rings and it's a reporter catching you at home asking your opinion on a matter that just you know a fight that happened on a campus where police were involved or something um again magic words thank you so much we have an appointed pio 
uh, uh, and you need to contact the superintendent's office or our PIO's office for comment and not allow yourself to get unintentionally caught up in being a district spokesperson. So guys, you've got a great handbook. It, if you, they took it, I thought I recognized you. Good to see you. Excuse me. I know her from Redlands Board from years ago. So the um, you've got a great handbook. It's a great tool. Uh, what Frank is asking you to do is to take a look at it. If you see anything that needs to be revised, could be said differently, I believe you're going to agendize it for a uh, an upcoming board meeting for adoption. So if you have input, reach out to Joanne or to Frank and share that. Let's see what I've got. I always put in extra slides. I'm going to skip my 10 steps. This is in case I had tons of time left. And I didn't know what to do. I have. So. I am going to ask you to reflect for a minute about what clarity or insight. What's one thing we talked about today that was brought some clarification aside from Barry Manilow writing that that you can't say that of uh, that you came away with, or maybe a reminder of something that mattered to you. I see Bertha grabbing the mic. Does that mean you have something? To, can you share? No, um, I just like the. Um... The fact that we really need to bring the um, the, the, um, the handbook. No, not the handbook. Oh. The, our vision statement or our, oh, our, our um, yeah, your design design statement. vision. Yeah, to life. I mean, yeah. to me, our next step is to make sure that this that this is a true document that everybody knows, everybody talks about, and really dig into it. And it, it can it breathe easy. life into your work. That's for sure. It's a great one. Israel, do you have a kind of a parting words today? Let's just continue uh, putting our students first. And I think we do that every day and uh, every board meeting and at every meeting that we're in. Just continue to do that and continue to keep that as a vision so that our students succeed and they become someone and uh, and probably hopefully come back to this district and be the next board members or teachers or principals or superintendents. Superintendents, exactly. Great. Thank you. Frank, do you have a, we'll just go around since you're. Okay, uh, just uh, the process to go through this with the board. Um, my insight is, you know, I've been, we've been talking about this for several years to go through it. I know there's a lot of work uh, to be done, but I just appreciate the uh, vulnerability and the, the discussion today. I, um, I guess mine goes back to the thought of, it takes a village and it takes a board that works together to make things happen and to me when we do it respectfully and courteously we are role models children learn in a classroom by how a teacher behaves they learn appropriate behavior and i think it's really important as a board that we teach not only our children and our, our staff but the community as a whole how to make good decisions um, we are role models, and that's an important part. The next steps would be to go through this uh, on our own to me and um, and come back with making any revisions and actually making this uh, a part of our policy that we have actually all endorsed and voted on and put in place forever. It changes as needed down the road, but it's really important that we have something like this to um, put your money where your mouth is or something like that. Um, thank you. Sorry. Um, I think um, going through this, I think it was great that our board has uh, agreed to do this. Um, when I got on the board, the board was not cohesive whatsoever. It was very divisive. And you couldn't speak out of turn. You couldn't do anything. And it was just it was a very difficult time to get on a board. And um, so to see us working together and I mean, like I said, we don't argue. We we talk and we, you know, we don't agree on everything, but it's just um we all have the same vision. We all want the best thing for kids. And 
you can't always say that about all school boards. You, uh, you know, some people look at school board job as stepping stone to being, a, you know, mayor or whatever, you know, and but this board is just, we just want to be a school board. We want to do the right thing for kids. We want to do the right things for our teachers. And all of us agree on that. You know, we want, that's, that's what we want to do. So I think this was a, this handbook will be a good thing for us to not only adopt, but also to have to reflect on when we need to. So, yeah, and I won't turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really like the, the exercise of asking ourselves individually and collectively the why, reminding ourselves, why did we run? Why did we run again and again and again in some cases? And, and having not, still asking. And, and it's a reminder of, um, I, I think, to never take for granted the opportunity that we have. And the day that I, you know, if I can't look in the mirror and answer that question well, is probably the day I need to say, you know what, it's time to take a step back and let somebody else come in with new energy, with new ideas. If I can't give 100%, um, let somebody else come in and, and give their 100%. So that's an important exercise that, that I think I have forgotten to do periodically. So I yeah, appreciate that. Right. Okay, I get to go last. Um, first of all, I want to just say thank you, Gary, for the facilitation this uh, workshop. Um, I agree with my colleagues. I think one of the things that is important for us to always recall is that why are we here and why are we, are we uh, continuing to run for the school board? Um, everything that we went over and everything that we discussed was very, very uh, important for us to to go over, but also to remember and recall uh, and do on a daily basis. I think that uh, the governing board, we lead by example. And uh, I think that taking that responsibility and leading by that example that we're trying to put together here uh, is is so important because it then it, it just continues to uh, provide our staff, our superintendent with the guidelines, the knowledge of what we would like to see, but what we all would like to see happen in behalf of our students and the community. So um, this is just a great practice. Just want to thank you for, for being here and facilitating this. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, you have a great team, Frank. You have a great superintendent board. You have an excellent executive assistant who has been, even found me in the parking lot and brought me in here. That could that alone she gets points for today. Um, the next, after you adopt this, the real tool, when you guys run the ne next election and let's say you have a half dozen candidates pull papers, it's an opportunity for Frank to bring people in so that even if they don't get elected, they can learn what a governance team looks like and you can educate people uh, as to what a board what a board position is. So you don't elect somebody who thinks they get a company car and, and come here and help to run the district. Um, That'll help a bit. So thank you very much. I can see that the military has showed up for us. So thank you very much, you guys. It was a good meeting. You will see me next week. Next week. Uh, I guess with all, thank you so much for being here tonight. We do appreciate that very much. And thank you, my colleagues, for taking the time today to make this important commitment to us. And with that, a special